video. So we're video. All right, so welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the DMAIC methodology and how it can help project management oversight. Now, many of you have probably um, are familiar with DMAIC. It has been around for quite a while. It was around in manufacturing to try to uh, to try to reduce defects in manufacturing. Uh, it is part of Six Sigma. So if you're doing anything with Six Sigma, it's not uncommon for you to have a component of this. Uh, but in the last number of years, people have been using this in project management because it's such an efficient process. And so we're gonna walk through it, looking at it through the eyes of project management, and we'll show you some of the different uh, things and ways that people are using this in a very effective way. So what is DMAIC and how is it defined? Well, it's an acronym for the process used in Six Sigma methodologies primarily right now. It's a program, a process or a methodology used to define, measure, analyze, improve, and control the quality of an organization. Uh, DMAIC is a data-driven process with high team interaction in every section. DMAC is not, a product, is not as productive when done as a solo activity. Now by solo activity, in other words, if you've got management doing this and then feeding the results and the information to, to the other people, then you're gonna miss something in most cases just because management will not, uh, would not catch everything. This works best in that team setting where the team is able to interact and look at things because you're gonna be looking at either defects or problems, or you're gonna be looking at something that has gone wrong or is going wrong, and this is going to help to be able to pull all of that together. DMAIC is an extension of what was what we know as PDCA. Many of you have used this for years. This was created by a uh, theoretician Shuhart many years ago, and it's Plan, Do, Check, Act. Now, now Dr. Deming is who made it really famous, uh, but Shuhart came up with this to where you plan, do, check, and act as four steps to be able to solve a problem or four steps in being able to reduce the defects. So DMA, DMAIC can repeat after after one com uh, completes it as many times as necessary. So in other words, you can continue to go back through it over and over again to be able to, to make sure that you're weeding out all the defects or all of the, all of the bugs or whatever you're using this for. It's popular because it places the project or problem into a process temporarily and then transfers it right back to operations. So if you're using DMAIC to solve problems in the organization or in the agency, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because short term, you've got that problem in a process that allows you to be able to have some structure. And then when it finishes, you're able to fix it and then roll it right back out to uh, so that everybody's using whatever they're doing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. A cycle time to move through the DMAIC depends on the project, also depends on the organization. And so some of our problems that we're using for DMAC might be very complex. And the analysis section alone that we're gonna talk about a little bit later here could be much more extensive. Uh, also, cycle time to move through it could depends on the project or the organization, and some organizations can move through the process quickly, while others, you might be working a couple of years to be able to change things. Uh, DMAIC can be used in continuous improvement, and when you see it in continuous improvement, sometimes you see it from that aspect as well. All right, so why would somebody choose this particular strategy of using DMAIC? Well, first off, projects and organizations focus on continuous improvement and high quality to maintain, com maintain their competitiveness. Now, when you're looking at it through the eyes of a project, many times people are thinking about other, other decision-making models or other problem-solving models and not DMAIC. But this is really geared very specifically to look for what is going wrong or to create continuous improvement. So continuous improvement requires organizations to change. So the change could be minimal, it could be extreme. And so this is why DMAIC is connected so closely to areas of change, whether it is product, process, or people. Because what, what are we doing today? But we're going through an enormous amount of changes in all these different areas. And so if we're looking at trying to change the product or what we produce, uh, whether it's a product or service, then you might want to use it to see where can you better things. If you're using it for a process for to make sure you streamline your processes, you might do that. Or even with people, how can we change things to where we have better resources and our resources are stronger or more, more qualified? Now, I believe, I don't know if it's next month, but I think next month we're gonna look at process improvement during this time to kind of go along and dovetail uh, with this, if I'm not mistaken. 
Okay, so as we look at DMAC, it's scalable, and this helps you be able to beef it up or, or trim it down to whatever it is you're trying to do. So if you look at DMAIC, you've got business that can use it, you've got operations, and you've got projects that can use this. And so this makes this a tool that's very easy for you to be able to use because it can actually, it can actually dovetail with anything that you're doing in any part of the organization. Now, let's look at it first off from a business level. So DMAIC from a business level. Uh, it creates strategic plans, set goals for return on investment, and the funding of portfolios to support a healthy and successful future. Uh, decisions involve strategies to maintain the profitability and the repositioning the organization. Organizational repositioning can happen many times over the series of years to keep the organization's position with their customers. Now, if you're not working for an organization that has to reposition every so many years, then this might be new to you. But many companies out here are repositioning with their products and services in order to be able to stay competitive. So if you're looking at a company that's 60 years old, that company has had to re, re, do new processes and they've also had to reposition how they were going to be able to stay in business and how how they were going to be able to keep their cust get to their customers and new customers and stay profitable. And any, every, every business has to reposition every so many years, and you'll see them do that. Uh, also, DMAC AIC helps create strategic change from a macro, and macro is going to be the highest level, or executive level. It uses a structure to shift from one direction to another with massive change. Now, many organizations right now are looking at, at using DMAIC because they're looking at moving their workplace from the workplace to where they, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're, do, they're connecting with uh, their people and letting their people work from home. And so where they did it temporarily, and that was fine, many of them are, going, are looking at this as being the new norm for some of these organizations. And of course, that's happening all across, uh, all across the, the, uh, the world, actually, uh, because we're trying to deal with the pandemic. So if we look at this from a business level, the focus normally is on cost. So if you're looking at DMAIC, so you're looking at the impact on the bottom line, what does it take for us to remain profitable? And you'll have normally two different pots that you're looking at. One is what they would call hard savings or costs. And so what can we remove in costs that would, that would allow us to, have, to keep more money, that would allow us to have, better, uh, uh, have a better return on investment with everything? And then the other is on the soft savings, which is cost, which is avoidance. In other words, how can we avoid to do certain things or purchase certain things because that's going to cost us as well. And so we avoid things. So removal of stuff that we're already paying for or avoidance to keep us from needing to, to purchase things or needing to use something down the road. And of course, this is ch constantly changing in business. And a lot of this is being driven due to the technology that we see. Let's look at it from the focus in business on change. So you'd look at the type and the amount of change. And so what you're looking at is how long, you're, how long do you think it's going to take you to get all these changes implemented over time? So you'll notice some are going to change immediately. And we do that. We have some changes that we can institute instantly, and it, there's very little ripple effect with that. But then notice you've got change within the next one to three months, change within four to 12 months, and then change normally within one to three years. And of course, so as you're working on these changes, you're changing the culture of the organization. You're changing the product and services maybe of the organization. But you might even be changing how, what, what, uh, what resources or people you need working for your organization. Because uh, because the needs are going to be different possibly in three years. If we looked at it as connected to quality and DMAIC is normally connected to quality and performance, it can connect to other quality and continuous improvement initiatives. We look at a problem we're having with a process or a product or a quality issue, and we start using that process to try to get away from, from what's going wrong in that quality situation. Uh, some of the connections such as Kaizen would be to stop or reduce change, uh, surface or implement, share. And so a lot of different things. And Kaizen, as you know, is, is, uh, means continuous improvement in Japanese. And that's exactly what organizations are having to do. How can I uh, create continuous improvement for our organization? From an operational level or business unit, a consistent focus for any organization, such as efficiency saves time and ultimately money. 
uh, consistently look for new ways to produce the product, to deliver high quality products to the customer, and then focus on innovation, either through the implementation of new technology or renovation of the same technology with faster delivery processes. And so what can we do to be able to be more efficient? What can we do to speed things up so it gets to the customer faster? I mean, one of the main reasons why we love Amazon is because we can get so many things from Amazon within a couple of days. And so that's why we love that. And so if we go someplace shopping and we're asking about something and they say, well, I can order it for you. So many people, I don't know if you're like me, I don't want them to order it because that's really going to take longer to order it from them. I'd rather go ahead and order it from Amazon and have it sitting on my porch within a few days. Now, if we look at DMAC from an operation standpoint, and you're looking at it, like I said, from efficiency. So what kind of efficiency? Efficiency in the processes, efficiency in the product, that's what's produced, and efficiency of the people so that our people are doing the most important thing at all times and that our people are also uh, as trained or as equipped as they should be at all times. Now let's go a little further and look at DMAC AIC from a project level because that's where uh, we we're going to use it and that's where you're seeing people really shine with this today. So the focus is going to be on quality and continuous improvement and it connects to the programs and the projects of the organization. At the end of each project, we should be doing a lessons learned if we're doing a, a traditional project or a retrospective if we're doing a scrum or agile project. That scrum, or I'm sorry, that retrospective or that lessons learned should be feeding information back to management or back to leadership so that we make sure that we are continually improving the processes and the engagements and the communication for a project. DMAIC is a structure for verifying major changes within the scope of the project, as well as the impact of the project project has on other processes within the organization or business unit. DMAIC also helps for problem solutions within the project by providing a thorough, uh, a thorough examination of any problem. So that last bullet point on that slide is why people are jumping over to use this on projects because nothing is more frustrating to us than getting on that project and having that thing, having that problem recycle several times. We get very frustrated uh, with all of that. So let's look at it from the project level graphically here. So you be, you're looking at the scope of the project. And so as you look at it from the scope, you're looking at the statement of work, the WBS, and then verification that we understand what we're supposed to do. So DMAIC would, do, uh, would be the process that would be used to see, are we getting the right scope or all the scope of the project? Are we breaking it down to the proper levels of WBS? And then also, how are we verifying that what we understood from the customer, we're also providing and, and working on with our people. And so that's, that's why it's so important to be able to do this. Now, does DMAIC give us any benefits? The answer is yes. It encourages teamwork and creative thinking for solving problems, creating stronger solutions. And that's why you're wanting to use this with your team is because of that. Also, it allows everyone to, to benefit from a process which works well with projects, processes, services, or products. So this little process that you're using to be able to solve this problem is going to work very well because you've got your processes and that you're using for your project, whether it's you're running it in Agile or Scrum, and then you can actually bring this in, fix your problem, and then run it, leave it, leave with that process, and it stops. And now you are able to run everything still with the project processes that you've been running. So that's very much a benefit for that. Okay, so let's go through each of these stages, okay, each of these different phases. So the first is for, for this is going to be define. This is a hard situation because people misdefine the problem many times. Many of you have already seen this happen uh, in a team. So define is a way of building the specifics for the project when it is not meeting the objectives. Uh, many problems are inherently defined, which reduces the chance of solving the problem quickly. And define allows the development of the scope requirements and outcomes, and it focuses on quantifiable terms or measurements. Many times we have defined the wrong thing. So that means that when we start doing analysis, we're analyzing the wrong thing. And when we start getting ready to fix something, we're fixing the wrong thing. And many of you have probably seen this happen happen on a project. Uh, Define must keep in mind that there is change management culture following and change is part of a project, but also could be part of the organization as quality and performance aligns uh, the project with the organizational goals. You also have that uh, measurement phase. That measurement phase is very important because you're going to be collecting data in this phase. 
Many people are not very good at collecting data or they have a tendency to make a lot of assumptions on data. And so that causes them to make gut gut reactions and knee jerk decisions that don't benefit the project. So collecting the data and creating metrics for the project processes or organizations can sound easy, but are more difficult to sustain over time. The goal of collecting data is to validate the assumptions made uh, by the team that bases opinion on limited information. Organizations tend to track time, money, and risk, and most cultures support the tracking of these three, but sometimes people resist adding other metrics. Now, we, we track time, money, and risk because that's what management tracks right now. Nothing wrong with that. We should track that. But there might be other areas, such as quality, such as performance, that we should be tracking that would give us a different insight. Now, what you're not wanting to do is have just a, le a this least little bit of information and make all your decisions on that one little blurb of information. Uh, you're not wanting to do that. You're, we are actually, you're seeing uh, some of this actually evolve even as we go through the pandemic. Uh, more and more information comes out. More and more people have, have gotten the shot. More and more people uh, now, you know, they're able to give more feedback on what's happening to people and what kind of, what are some of the drawbacks of the shot. And, you know, we, the thought was, is that we're going to have that one shot and maybe it would never have to have it again. Now the discussion of boosters, because more information comes in, says that, hey, it's starting to dip a little bit. So we're seeing this fleshed out in a lot of different ways because you don't know what you don't know. That same thing could be happening to you on a project in that you've got initial information, you've thought about it, you're doing it, things are going great, but then all of a sudden as more and more information and the longevity of that research goes on, you discover something else. And so it's just a little bit different than what you originally thought. And so those things are going to happen, especially when you're talking about new technology and new approaches to trying to do some, some things. Then after you've collected your data, you're now ready to go to the analysis phase. Many people are not very good at analysis. So after data collection, the team's ready to analyze the data, create hard facts about changes needed. And these hard facts have to get away from a knee-jerk reaction or have to get away from somebody just has it in their gut that this is a change that needs to happen. Many teams will create process flows, a series of hypotheses, or listing of cause and effect scenarios. All of those are good, and all of those could be beneficial based on the project. Here's the hypothesis that we have. Here's how the processes flow right now, and we need to look at that. Here's a listing of some of the cause and effect type of situations that we're dealing with. And every one of those, you might find yourself having to break it apart and work on that process or work on that cause and effect scenario. Each process flow hypothesis or cause and effect a scenario is compared to factual data. So as we look at data that we've, that we've been able to collect and we know this is factual, how is, that, how is that data corresponding with what we're doing and how we're doing it? Also with analysis, it sometimes begins in the analysis, hypothesis sometimes begins in the analysis phase, but continues into the improved phase uh, before validation of any assumptions is complete. And all that's really showing you is the complexity of analysis. Analysis is not one person saying we're going to do this. Analysis is looking at the data and realizing where the data is showing the gaps or the process problems or, or any of those type of issues. Analysis and improved work hand in hand to, uh, toward the creation of solutions. Now the improved phase also is sometimes is a carryover from analysis because we start implementing, but we're still going back to analysis and we start, the, start improving, but we still go back to analysis. So you're bouncing back and forth with some of these. Many of you have, have done this in real life. So the focus is on adding numerical measurements to justify potential direction, but that's coming from the analysis side. And then the improved side is based on that numerical information. Implementing the solution is part of the successful reduction of, pro of the problem. When solutions do not resolve the problem, objectives, uh, then adjustments are made for better implementation. So you put this in to improve, but didn't improve it enough or didn't fix all the problem. Fixed a lot of it, but not all of it. And so you find yourself going back to the data to then come back and work on that even further with some of those, uh, some of those things. The next is measuring results to validate the solution is, fi is fixing the specific issue, not just changing the problem to something else. This happens all the time. Many of you have lived through this where we, where we think we fixed something and all we didn't have now is a new problem. And then they think they fixed that. Well, now we have a different new problem. And that just, it's very frustrating. People are just kind of changing the flavor of the problem uh, over time. 
then after you have started improving, you're now ready to control this. This is where you're going to be able to monitor it. This is where you're going to be able to kind of keep things uh, going in the right direction. So the focus is on moving the problems from current team over to operations. So the operations people would be <clears throat> the ones who are going to be using this on a day-to-day -day basis. So it solves the problem, it creates standards, operating guidelines so the events do not happen again, and that was what the whole purpose is for doing this. Transition of the process or project is then shifted to the operational staff for long-term maintenance. Now, many of you probably have seen a red in, when you were in school, this happening in manufacturing. And so you saw people realize that there was manufacturing defects that were happening. They worked on this, they fixed those, and then they turned it right back over to operations and fixed those problems in, in the operational environment so that they they were producing a quality product. And, uh, and that's exactly what you're doing. You could be doing that with a service or project or whatever. The need for accurate data. Accurate data drives DMAIC process and all decision making. Uh, inaccurate data leads the decisions away from truth and ultimately to bad outcomes. Why? Because it's not based, it's based on fantasy. And with it being based on fantasy, that means that you're making a decision that is not, not based on truth. You're going to go in the wrong direction in most cases. So what makes data inaccurate? Let me give you some of the most common things that we've seen. Uh, no validation before using it. In this world and with internet, there are crazy people who write articles, okay? They're crazy people. They have a position and they have solutions and they have ideas. And many times they write very well, but their data is very inaccurate. They made inaccurate assumptions, which have turned around and made inaccurate solutions, okay? So who is this person that's written a paper? Just because they're Dr. Dud over here doesn't mean that this is somebody you need to be listening to. What have they done? And where, you know, where is their name to claim? Uh, so no validation before using it. Multiple streams of data collection from other departments or areas outside of the team's control. You'll see a lot of times people will be sending in data about different things that they're wanting you to do. But once again, how good is that data and who's written it and what's, you know, what's the background with that company? Many of your salespeople, you probably have already noticed this, that if you bring in salespeople to try to, uh, to get an idea of what, uh, what uh, kind of help you can get from them, uh, now all of a sudden they go in a direction, they can give you all these stats and data of how they're going to be able to help you fix the problem. Well, of course they do. And of course they will, because that is going to be something that is connected to them getting a sale. And so, of course, they're going to have that. Their, their, their solution is always going to be the best and everybody loves them. OK, but my point is, is that understand they have an ulterior motive when they're sending you this information. Uh, lack of training for those who collect and interpret it. Uh, many people have never had to, to collect data, never had to interpret it before. And so what happens is one person can say it and they'll quote that person and they feel like they've done research. Uh, I have that problem with my doctoral students right now. They'll quote some Dr. Dud from some little nothing university and they want to use that one little quote from that doctor to justify this whole big methodology or premise and usually i'll go back and i'll say okay i want three three main people in this uh, this field uh who who either agree with it or talk about this topic and of course they're frustrated because what they don't realize is that i'm wanting them to do the academics and the scholarly thing of making sure that that really is a bona fide methodology not just because dr dud said that so lack of training, calculation errors or improper rounding of data. We can round data up to such a point where we can almost make everything say what we want to say. We've all sat there and heard percentages. We've all sat there and heard numbers and we can make it say a lot of what we want to say. And so you're wanting to double check that. Make sure it is, it, that the data is saying what it, what it says, not what you want it to say. Uh, so no measurement system for specific data needs. Many people don't measure anything. And so once again, they say, well, in, you know, in my opinion, and so what we want is to be, move away from somebody's opinion uh, is our desire. So here's some characteristics to help evaluate where data is accurate. First thing, how old is the data? Because the older the data is, and data today gets outdated in some fields, it might be outdated within, within a week. Uh, some data, it might be several years old. And so the point is, is that depending on your field, your industry, and, and, and what, uh, what it is you're researching, data is changing very, very quickly in some areas. Did the data come from a biased group or an organization? This is what I was talking to you about a company. Uh, so if it came from a biased group or an organization, then that's going to be, that's going to automatically make you think that they could be seeing just these particular things and not telling, the, <laughs> excuse me, not telling the other side. 
uh, what is the level of education of the researchers? Some people are good writers, but they don't have that education to be able to back it up from research. I am so sorry. So they don't have the education or to back up the research. What's the level of expertise of the researchers? So are these just new researchers who might uh, short circuit the process? And then also, what is the, uh, does the research include all critical aspects of the incident? Or is it just hitting a handful of those? And it might, uh, you know, it might be that uh, you'll have some research for one part of something and other research for another part, and that's okay. But you're wanting them to show the show, you know, do due diligence as they're doing that research. Now, there are some challenges when people use DMAIC. DMAIC will not work if the culture only discusses the methodology but refuses to use it. Uh, many companies will talk this junk to death. And you, and you maybe have sat there and, and heard this. They'll talk about it, and they'll talk about the strengths of it and the, the, you know, the, the weaknesses of this stuff. But they need to do more than just talk about it. We need to be able to use this. It's what we're needing, needing to be able to do. So lip service hurts the morale and motivation of the employees because we've all sat in those meetings where we talk, talk about the problem, but we don't solve it. Next week, we talk about it again. And then the next week, we talk about it again. And it's like you're rehashing that problem three or four times. Now, that probably doesn't happen for most of you. But if, if you've sat in those meetings, you think, oh, my gosh, just poke me in the eye. I mean, because, you know, let's decide something. Uh, but the big thing here it develops a strong undercurrent that supports a lack of trust because you feel like you're not moving forward. And as a PMO, as an organization, as management, as a project manager, we need to be trying to move forward. So when switching to DMAIC, people may uh, be resistant because it includes high levels of data and expectations for the team. The team's having to make a decision and be accountable for that decision. Some organizations might even fight with the syndrome of we, uh, we can't syndrome. We've all uh, been around people like this. Uh, changes are happening too fast. Customers or products or solutions are customized for them. And so we can't do that. Or having a large variety of products prevent us from using this. And so people can have a lot of different uh, excuses for why we can't get better or why we can't uh, deal with the processes and the issues that's causing us these problems. And of course, it all comes back down to we're not willing to pay the price to get it straightened out in the first place. So here's some of the benefits of using that cause and effect diagram, because one of the things that you're going to find is when you're using DMAIC, you're going to be using cause and effect diagrams to look at here's the cause and here's how it's, how it's impacting the organization or the project or the program. So cause and effect diagrams are useful tools in any industry or organization for resolving problems. Uh, they cause and effect diagrams create engaged base, engagement based on specific topics for problem resolution. Uh, it establishes a process for discussion of all areas. It encourages the team interaction and discussion, and it guides the team toward the root cause. So when you're looking at a cause and effect diagram, that's what you're looking for with uh, moving into the to five whys or the root cause analysis. And this allows you to be able to get some structure to this. Now, I saw this on the web, and I really like this because this was a publisher that had a fishbone for a missed deadline. And so I, rather than create another one, I thought this was excellent because he's got people, methods, measurements, machine, environment, and materials. And so I did training for newspapers uh, years and years ago when we first started. We did uh, the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch and did a lot of training for them. Uh, but in looking at this, they've done a good job on all the things that can contribute to a missed deadline. And so they've put it into the cause and effect diagram or a fishbone diagram to be able to come up with this. And I thought this was just excellent the way they did this. Because as, if you don't know anything about a newspaper, a newspaper, their main objective is they've got to hit a deadline. They've got new content that is mandated to be out at a particular time, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever, whatever that happens to be. Now, types of cause and effect diagrams you probably have been exposed to, uh, 3M or IP or 1P, uh, you've got methods, materials, machinery, and people. Uh, you could have be exposed to the 4P type of cause and effect, which is policies, procedures, people, and plant. And so on that fishbone, you're putting these terms in those different quadrants on the fishbone. But you could make up your own that are, that are real specific for the project. ADM, we've given you a list of that. The 8Ps, we've given you a list of this. The four S's of surrounding suppliers, systems, and skills. You can put whatever you're needing to to be able to uh, work on that cause and effect diagram or that fishbone diagram. 
So whatever makes sense in your culture uh, with your project or your organization can definitely be put there. Now, problem management. So as you're working through this analysis, uh, you're, you, there's a problem management responsibility flow. And so what you're looking to do is you're going to surface some problems. So look at the what. These are going to be the problems or the defects, what's going wrong. The how. How is the, pro how is the process? What is the process to resolve? The who. Who's going to be responsible for fixing that problem? And then the when, what is the expected delivery or resolution date? And so this allows you to be able to start documenting some of those problems and putting some structure to it. Then also symptom, what are the noticeable problems or symptoms? Disease, what are the potential root causes or drivers of the problem? And then cure, that's going to be your solution. What are potential solutions in order of priority? And so this is what you're, you and your team are working on. And you're gonna, you might have a whole listing of potential solutions that you've got there are potential problems as you're, as you're working on that. So what are defects? Defects can include many different aspects of waste, breakage, bad processes, or low productivity. Uh, the definition comes through the view of the customer in the industry. And one industry might track something as a defect while another does not. Waste, breakage, bad processes, low productivity can include multiple subcategories. Now, when, when they're talking about waste, breakage, bad processes, low productivity, of course, that's going to be different for construction people than it would be for programs. It's going to be different for, uh, for people in, in networking than it would be for people who are building the highway. So you've got a lot of different projects. You've got a lot of different problems. But the point is, is that some of these would be a little different as you look at them. The goal is to measure for defects is to measure those items uh, which are most important and influence the return on investment, continuous improvement and customer satisfaction. Now the warning, just because someone can measure an item does not mean it, it benefits anyone if it is measured. Some people are measuring uh, on such an ungodly amount of stuff that it's, they're overwhelmed with just the data that, and what they're trying to analyze. So measure what makes sense. That's what you're wanting to do. Does this make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, then, then we need to measure something different. So there's some common reasons for defects. And so you could have defects in something. And so it could be bad material. It could be a lack of training, bad processes. It could be limited metrics. We're not really measuring the right stuff. And it could be sporadic inspections. If we increased our inspections, that might actually help us. Or it might not be any of these. There might be other reasons why you're having some bad defects with what you're working on. So what's the usability of DMAIC? People have used it for years in the manufacturing world. So you've got machine defects, product defects. Why is this product not performing at the level that we want? Process defects, the process is not producing at the proper speed uh, that we want. And then solution defects, we've got a solution, but that solution is not solving the problem as we thought it would. And so once again, you could have solution defects. So let's look at machine defects. They focus on does the machine produce at the correct speed? Does the machine give product outputs which are correct? Does the machine work daily without breaking down? Does the machine increase or decrease when solutions or fixes are applied? And so what you're looking at here is you're just to kind of get you thinking about defects associated with, uh, with the machine. What about product defect? Does the product meet the requirements or specifications? Does the product meet the level of quality and all expectations? Does the time to make the product meet the expectations of the uh, operator or of management? Because once again, it could be taking too much time to be able to, to, uh, to pump that product out. Reducing the defects, and this is what many, many are absolutely wanting to do. So you'll notice your red line there is your defects that were found. And so everything in the green is what you fixed of the defects. And then you're looking at how many defects are remaining. And so this is a huge discussion within uh, the team to try to decide what do we do with all of those things in the yellow? And so which of these do we need to fix now? And then process defects, does the process run as efficiently as desired? Does the process have waiting time which slows the product production down? Does the process seem redundant in places? Does the process have multiple sign-offs which have no value? 
Does the process include distorted steps, which are not followed by the personnel on a daily basis? So that means we've got a process, but nobody's following. I've seen that happen in so many different places. And so that could be one of the problems or challenges you see with uh, processes. So if we were looking at a process, let's say, let's look, break it down into three, three different categories here. So let's say it's followed correctly by some. Let's say it's followed incorrectly by some. And let's say some people didn't, don't even function as if we have a process to follow. They just kind of do their own thing. So if we're following it correctly, then steps are followed. Documentation is included. And so all of those parts are there. If we're following it incorrectly, then we're missing steps or we're not, the details are left out about uh, documentation or inaccurate steps. And if we're not following it at all, it's difficult to, you could be difficult to use. It could be no reinforcement for management to follow the process or unclear. And so people have been able to get by with bypassing the process all this time. And so somebody's going to have to come in and say, we're going to follow the process. Now you'll see this sometimes with policy and procedure manuals in an organization. Policy and procedures tell you when and what the steps are to do something. And yet people are bypassing those steps. Uh, day in and day out. And so the thing is, is that the policy says to do it, but we're not following that. So if something happens, you could technically be fired for not following the policy. Even if you said everybody else is doing it, it doesn't matter. The policy says it, and yet we still aren't doing those things. Some also would look at the solution defect and focus on these questions. Does the solution connect to the root cause of the problem? Does the problem surface again? Does the solution make sense in cost, time, and effort? Does the chosen solution appear as a long-term fix rather than a short-term Band-Aid? And what we've gotten uh, become commonplace and, and almost callous to is that we have learned how to fix problems with a Band-Aid and, and they're only temporarily fixed and we continue to see them resurface over and over again. Very frustrating to us, very frustrating to the team. So let's give you an example. <clears throat> so let's say um, we were using the DMAIC case. Let's, this is gonna be our case. So I've got a PMP trainer when using the old PMP exam prep material, experiences a 70% first time passing rate. However, let's say in the past three months while using new PMP exam prep material, the passing rate drops to 50%. Now we can have a lot of hypothesis as to why this is happening, but the point is you're wanting to collect some data here and see what is going on. A 50% passing rate, it's costing us money through the guarantee to allow somebody to take the test again and again. And uh, why, what's caused this person to drop in their passing rate and not at least stay right around the 70%. You're wanting them to be stronger, but, not, but what would cause them to drop like this? So it could be a training issue, obviously. It could be that they don't understand the material. It could be that they're not giving enough time to certain sections of the material. It could be a lot of things. But I could send them off for training, but what if training's not it? they're still going to fail everybody it's still going to fail at 50 percent so there has to be enough analysis to be able to look at this to be able to pull it all all uh, together and know what this is going to be so what is the problem can you say it is a, in a simple phrase to yourself so what do you think the problem is and secondly the problem statement the trainer is experiencing low passing rates for a pmp exam course and so these are low passing rates is going to be your problem statement and then the potential causes, you, we could list a lot of potential causes, but that's where your analysis is going to help you. Listing the potential reasons why a trainer's passing rate could decrease 25% could be huge. Could be he's going through a divorce and having a tough time. And so what's happened is his mind's not there. It could be a lot of things. But right now, you don't know why other than it's happening, and it's happening quite a lot. Also with DMAIC, one of the things that you get into is incident defined. Defined, An incident has a broad definition because of the influence of the industries and organizations. An incident is an unplanned sequence of activities that has underlying causes, which could impact safety, performance, processes, finances, or the environment. Incidents can surface due to past changes to the processes, procedures, or projects when ancillary influences might be overlooked. And incidents drive the decision whether to conduct an analysis and what level of analysis. And so as we look at incidents, here's some of the incident levels that we might look at. So a large con consequence incidents influences many people's or group, many people or group and major damage or major shutdowns. And so it has a major impact. 
a near miss incident, a minor influence on others because it is so close to the desired outcome. Minor incident could, could uh, become larger, but it's a near miss. And then we have a mixed multiple incident. And that means there are several incidents having that impact the group at large. Each incident is small, but together it was very damaging and parking lot lights going off at, uh, at the wrong time. And by itself, it might not be a bad, big deal, but because it goes off at a certain time in the winter time, that it's super dark and people have fallen. And so you see those type of things happen. So one incident alone is not a problem, but when you put it together with other things, it actually skyrockets. All right, let me pull this together and talk a little bit about the mastermind group. For those of you who don't have your PMP who would like to be part of this, this is free. This is the mastermind group in October. Uh, you invest about an hour a day in it. You can do it any time of day that you want. And so you do it for five days. And so it combines training, coaching, and direction, helps you remove some of the obstacles that people experience with setting, with, with uh, filling out the application for the PMP. So I've got several videos to help you fill a lot of this out. You would then work on your application, your documentation for, uh, for PMI. We've given you some, uh, an Excel sheet that will help you give some structure there. I do two virtual calls during that mastermind group to allow people to ask questions two times, two evenings that week. We do a, do a uh, mastermind call and with Zoom and everybody can call in and, uh, and be part of that. And then we give one scholarship away for the next, for not just the next, it could be, uh, uh, be the, any of the PMP exam prep boot camps but we give one full scholarship away. So you're able to come to the boot camp for free. You'll pay for your own test. And there's no guarantee on this, but you're able to come to the boot camp for free. So we give one scholarship away per mastermind group. And anybody who's in the mastermind group, our normal fee is like 2,500 per person. And then most people will pick up an early bird, which is 1950, uh, because if they're wanting to come to the PMP. But here, if you come through this, you're, you're getting the lowest fee that's out there, which is 1550. And that's with a guarantee if you want to do that. So it's even cheapened the price that you would have to pay for this thing here. So sign up for the mastermind group. I am planning on doing mastermind groups in 2022. And so, uh, so you'll be looking for them. We don't have them on the schedule yet, but I am planning on doing a couple next year. Uh, I liked it. I liked uh, the way it worked with people, getting people in the gear. Uh, so if you'd like to be part of that, go to our website and look for the mastermind group and sign up. Also, uh, I think this is a, a, a lot of benefits here for this because you got videos, you'll get a memory chart of the, of the current PMP test. You'll have a practice PMP test of, I think it's 25, it might be 50 questions. Uh, you'll have direction on filling out the application, audit possibilities we talk about. You get five contact hours for attending this, two group calls, and then automatic rest registration in the drawing for a free scholarship uh, for the PMP exam uh, boot camp. And then the boot camps that we have coming up, we still have one beginning October 4th, 2021. Uh, well, I'm sorry, next month, our webinar is October 4th, uh, 2021. And it's on distressed projects, how to recover the failing project. And so we'll be talking about that next month. Uh, but our boot camps, you can find our boot camps out online if you're interested in looking for any of those. So let me stop right here and answer any questions that you might have before we get everybody off of the call and let you move on. Any questions from anybody? All right, everyone, thank you so much for being on the call. And so uh, uh, look for next month when we talk about failing projects. And uh, so I hope you have a wonderful week and stay healthy. So bye everybody, thank you, take care.